Hi, today I'm here with Dr. Francina Dominguez, who is a professor studying water vapor in the climate. Hi. Or is that how would you characterize your research? <laughs> yeah, hydroclimatologist or okay. hydrometeorologist. Cool. And uh, do you want to say a little bit about how you got into this work? Sure. Yeah. So um, I guess I'll go way back. So I am actually a civil engineer by training. Uh, I um, studied in Colombia, South America, and then uh, came to the United States uh, to do my graduate work in uh, 2001 in civil engineering. Um, but I always knew that I really liked atmospheric sciences. Uh, so as soon as I got to grad school, I began to take atmospheric sciences classes. And then uh, my to the topic of my graduate work was all related to the water cycle. So there's this part of civil engineering that is hydrology. It's usually within civil engineering departments. Um, and so my advisor was really nice and he let me basically kind of explore these topics that I really wanted to look at in the atmosphere. Um, so yeah, so ever since my master's, I've been looking at water vapor. And then for my PhD, I did work related to precipitation recycling. So essentially uh, trying to quantify of the water that falls in a particular region, how much of that rainfall came, uh, originated as evapotranspiration from within that region or from other terrestrial regions. Uh, so I, that was the main focus of my, my PhD. And honestly, even after my graduation, I've been working on and off on this topic since, yeah, for, for almost 20 years, essentially. Cool. Um, yeah, and it's an it's a issue of great concern around the world right now because there's areas that's a lot of drought and so therefore water shortages and not enough rain. And then there's other areas there's way too much rain and there's huge floods right now, like Pakistan yeah. just had one and Australia early this year. Yeah. So, so your, your research shed some light on uh, like both when we don't have enough rainfall and why we have extreme rainfall? Partially. So uh, one of the topics that I'm currently looking at is um, how, so when you have a drought, like let's say the 2012 drought in the Midwest, uh, we've been able to kind of trace back some of the origins of that drought, like some areas provided less water for the Midwest. and we kind of traced it back uh, westward to some regions that are traditionally uh, that traditionally uh, provide water to the, to the midwestern United States, and then those years provided a lot less. So, uh, essentially, how antecedent dryness conditions in source regions can then lead to drought in other regions. So, sort of like a propagation of drought in space. So this was, this is one of the things that we've been looking at. Um, and kind of tangentially related to your question is uh, uh, some work that I've been doing in South America related to Amazonian deforestation. So, and, and this is related to actually your first question, like, why was I interested in this topic to begin with? So I'm from Colombia and part of the Amazon forest is in Colombia. So we're really interested in, you know, what happens if you start deforesting this region? Will that affect rainfall? And so uh, part of the work that I've been doing more recently is uh, using a model to try to understand how much of the rainfall patterns in the Amazon uh, will change due to deforestation um, and then trying to get at, okay, is it recycling or is it maybe other processes uh, that are at play? And what we found is really, okay, when you, when you look at this from a modeling perspective, it's pretty unanimous. Yeah, there's a lot of um, robust results that when you deforest the Amazon, locally, you get a lot less rainfall. But 
one of the surprising things that we are finding is that it's not really due to recycling. It's more that you change the circulation patterns. So that was something interesting that we had kind of assumed all along that you deforest, so you just have less water coming down. But what we have found is that it's just that all the wind patterns and the circulation is affected when you deforest. So you're actually kind of shifting the rain to other parts downwind. That was kind of counterintuitive, to be honest, because I had began this whole process thinking about recycling, but it's taught me a lot about, you know, all the other things, the complexity of the atmosphere and the water cycle. Mm. So Colombia um, it, or, or other parts of South America, are they having less rain right now? Um, there, uh, so there are parts of the core Amazon that are uh, that do are experiencing less rain than before. Um, and I think we're pretty now we, we know that at least part of this can be attributed to deforestation over the deforested regions, but not in Colombia. As far as I know, there are no robust <coughs> tendencies in the Colombian Amazon regarding um, over the deforested regions. It's more kind of in the southeastern Amazon. Do they take? Did, have they taken rainfall measurements way back in Colum Colombia? Like, do they have rainfall? Uh, they're not great. Um, there are rainfall me measurements, but mostly like in Bogota. Um, I mean, there are long-term stations, but indeed, yeah, in the Amazon, there are almost none. Yeah. Mm. So, so yeah, that's a good point that, that there's a, there's a information scarcity in Colombia and actually in all of South America, there's, there's very sparse measurements. How much, uh, how far back does the rainfall data go in South America usually? Uh, it depends on what, on where you're looking at, right? I, I'm guessing maybe 50 years in the really good stations. Um, but yeah, I'm not, I'm not a hundred percent sure for, for all of the region. Uh, mm. the big cities have decades of data, uh, but, but other than that, it's spotty. Right. And just to, um, just to, so, so the model you're looking at with water vapor, so water vapor blows from, let's maybe just kind of discuss some sure. of the basic mechanisms. So water blows in from the ocean and then it goes down into the, gets absorbed in the land and some of it flows back out to the ocean, but some of it vapor transpires in a process that you guys term moisture recycling, is that right? Correct. So it goes back up, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so essentially, the, yeah, that's exactly it. So you have the currents that go into the contents, part of that rain falls down and then contributes to the surface or subsurface water. Another part just re-evaporates and then continues downwind. Uh, so in, you can think of this as kind of moisture hopping throughout the continents and then following the the large scale circulation patterns. Right. And so when you're saying the Midwest uh, lost some water in 2012, it's some of that water is coming in from the ocean, but some of it's like it first lands in California and then vapor transpires and hops like maybe to Nevada and then hops to the Midwest yes. or something like you that. would have part of the... So it's a little bit complicated because you also have the mountain range. So uh, so the, the Rockies are a huge obstacle for the water. Um, so you would have all, you would have kind of think about it in two different ways. Let's talk about the summer in the Midwest. So you would have part of the water, part of the, the circulation that's coming from the west, but then you have another part of the circulation that's coming from the south. So you have kind of these two, at upper levels, it'll be pretty west from the west, west uh, westerly, and at lower levels from the south. That's how in the Midwest, that's that's how it works during the summer. So you have these kind of these two sources, but again, the kind of you can think of it as going from the west and then north, moving northeast into into the central into the Midwest. Does that mean some of the water vapor is coming all the way south from Mexico, even to oh, the yeah. Midway? Okay. Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Central America, the Caribbean. 
So you have, they call it the, the Maya Express because it goes like really from the Caribbean up into uh, the Midwest, especially when you have like big flooding events. The trajectory of this water is just phenomenally long from, you know, the Caribbean up into the Midwest. Okay, cool. Yeah, just like you guys have the, the Pineapple Express. So the, the, the Central Plains have the Maya Express. Right. Okay, cool. And just for people listening, uh, some of you from a different demographic than the academic world where they call it moisture recycling and moisture hopping, um, it's called the small water cycle where the water goes down to the land, evaporates back up to the clouds and rains again. So, um, so I think different groups have developed different terminologies around this. Yeah, I, I just learned that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, so, so, uh, okay. So, how much? Yeah. So, how much is coming more from like California region, and how much is more coming from the Mexico region to the Midwest? Would you say to the Midwest? Are like in uh, on average for mm -hmm. the summer? Let me think. So it'll be. I I want to say like. 30 to 40 percent is from the it's from this the south mm -hmm. um so all this kind of corridor very little in the summer season from the from the west uh, maybe 10 percent or less it, it's more important during the winter like the cooler months you stop having this inflow from the south and then you have more of a western inflow so as the cooler season approaches then the west is is more important mm. and and where does the so if the water just say water vapor is blowing in from the ocean to california and then california say some of it rains down some of vapor transpires and blows further inland where yeah. does most of that go does it go and then kind of all across the u.s gradually and then yeah. hit all the way to the east coast and then blow yeah all the yeah, way off absolutely yeah yeah it just kind of continues into into the intercontinent yeah so you can just think of it as fo following and then it'll continue even beyond that right after after it transpires in and into the ocean yeah okay and how much would you say would blow all the way from one end of the u.s out back out Oof. But I guess maybe an, uh, an easier quantification is like how much of the rain in the East Coast comes from the land in the West or like terrestrial origin from the West. That right. I can answer. Okay, yeah, that's so about one. <laughs> it's, it's, it's really big. It's like 60% of the water that, that falls in the East mm -hmm. can be of terrestrial origin. Okay. So, yeah, so think of it as slowly kind of increasing from the West, not having a huge terrestrial signal to the East, having a very large terrestrial signal. And then how much of land use, uh, say in California, if you change the land use, say you pave over nature or you change the soil ability to absorb water, like how much effect does that then have on this moisture hopping in there? So I, don't know exactly. What I do know is um, what happens when you irrigate. So this was uh, one of the one of the studies that I did with with one of my students. It's okay. First of all, um, when you irrigate like these large agricultural regions like the Central Valley, um, we do see clearly that you are affecting the water cycle. So, so when we include the irrigation, uh, in a mo this is in the modeling world. So when you include irrigation, then you see, it, I think it's on the order of 10 to 20% increase in the precipitation over the irrigated regions. Um, and you do have effects downwind, but not so much related to recycling again, it's more related to changes in circulation patterns. So, that this is something that I've kind of that has been really important for me to realize over the last years is that we tend to think a lot in terms of the actual recycling of the moisture, but when you change the land, 
a lot of things change. This similar to what I was telling you about the Amazon forest, that you change the land and then you're changing the temperature of these regions. And that has effect on the overlying atmosphere. So the water cycle is not only about water, it's also about energy. And the changes in energy then can have other cascading changes in terms of pressure and then that drives winds. So it's all this interconnected system that uh, I think when I got into this, I didn't quite realize how interconnected this all is and how big a role energy plays when we're talking about changes in land cover. Mm -hmm. um, so, so again, to get back to, to what I was saying, when you, when you irrigate the Central Valley, you're changing the thermal properties and then that changes circulation patterns and then that affects precipitation. So, so it's really interesting, right? Like you, you kind of start off thinking about water and then all this other stuff comes into play when, when you do this changes, these changes. Yeah, wow, it's very interesting. So can you say a little bit more how the thermal properties changes? Are you saying that evapotranspiration then cools the earth and so that somehow affects something? In the exactly. Valley. Yeah. So, so you can generate um, changes in pressure close to the surface. So exactly what you're saying. So, for example, when there is transpiration, the a large part of that energy goes into changing the phase of the water, um, as opposed to sensible heat, which is the 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 actual temperature. So when when you when you irrigate, then you have a cooler surface and then the pressure near the surface, um, you, you're going to have like a, a higher pressure close to the surface uh, because the, the air molecules are kind of closer together. So close to the surface, it'll, there'll be higher pressure and this will have kind of cascading effects on, very, on kind of large scale circulation patterns in terms of highs and lows and then that'll affect wind. And this happens all over, like when we do simulations over South America and we change the land cover, you clearly see all these temperature, then pressure, then wind changes. So you're saying the pressure is higher in the Central Valley? The pressure changes. You are generating a higher pressure when you cool the land. Mm. Yeah, as opposed to as opposed to when you heat it, you get a thermal low. So you get lower pressure when, let's say you deforest, then you get lower pressure close to the, the surface. Or if you have a very dry surface, you get a low pressure there. Right, because, because uh, if it's hotter air, the hot air rises, so there's less air molecules left. And if it's- So yeah, you have just kind of, the, the molecules are more separated. So the pressure at a at a certain altitude will be lower. Yeah, yeah. And, and if it's cool, at, and if it's cooler the air doesn't rise as much and so it won't create less pressure there yeah yeah so no 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 but so when you it, it actually okay it depends i mean on it creates the, more pressure there i'm sorry yeah. the atmosphere you're talking about but yeah so if you're at the low at low levels a warmer surface will create a thermal low close to the surface mm -hmm. and then yeah and then that will change the circulation Right. And if it's cooler at the surface, if you have more water there, then the air, the cold air wants to sink. And so therefore exactly. there's higher pressure in that area. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, I mean, that happens all the time in continental regions. Then when you have, when the summer comes, the, the surface heats up and you have a thermal low, like that's one of the main drivers of monsoons is these uh, temperature anomalies at the surface, temperature changes at the surface. And so the air generally moves away from a high pressure. Uh, exactly. Area, right? Yeah. So yeah. so so if you create a high pressure over the central valley, which is in the central part of California, where does that uh, wind then blow? Which direction would it blow from the okay. central valley? It would be. It'll go away from. It'll go away from the from the high pressure and then to the right. So it'll be okay. But then you have the main circulation. So you're creating an anticyclone over the low, over the high pressure system because of Coriolis, because it'll go out, 
but then it has to turn to the right. <laughs> okay, so and uh, so wait, so uh, okay, so of a high pressure system, it goes in the northern hemisphere, it goes clockwise or anti clockwise? It goes clockwise when you're looking down from the top. Okay, yeah, yeah, okay, so it it'll bring yeah. so further inland in California, pass in further inland than in central California, the air, the wind mm. will blow southwards, kind of down towards so let LA. Me, let's, yeah, I think if you sh ah, but okay, your people can't can't see it. Let me just kind of in the I, I I have this okay so it'll go like that but then you also have some other currents so yeah 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 like this but then you also have the the currents from the south it's it's a little bit more complicated than the simple idea that I'm telling you you also have enhanced water coming from the south into like the the Colorado River and then but now I'm now I'm kind of where did that southern current come from? So now you're so, making me uh, doubt. <laughs> Wait, uh, just uh, uh, in terms of the water, so so some places will have more rainfall now because you irrigate Central Valley. Where did that more extra rainfall? Where does it end up being, or the extra water vapor? I just wait. Ah, okay. Oh. No, sorry. I end. I, I said something wrong because okay. it's not exactly over the central valley that the low pressure is. It's a little bit displaced westward. Okay. And there's going to be, no, it's going to be a little bit displaced. And then you have a, a wave train. So you have high, low, high. This is very complicated. And, and the big changes in the atmosphere are caused by the low. Anyway. This was way longer and more complex than I wanted to, to go, but I, all I wanted to say was there's changes in pressure that lead to changes in circulation and in the moisture transport. Okay. And then where does the most of the more water vapor get uh, focalized after? If you're irrigating a lot of central belt, where does that water okay, vapor so end up? You more? have one, one hot spot, which is the central valley itself. Mm -hmm. So you do see when we do this, these experiments, you see more precip over the central valley, over the regions that have been irrigated. Mm -hmm. But then the other thing that we saw, which was weird, was over the Colorado River Basin when we were like, OK, wait, but what's going on there? And then that was the area which was not related to recycling, but to changes in circulation. So it was over the Colorado River Basin that we saw enhanced precipitation not related to recycling. So Colorado Basin, is that in Colorado? The four corners, so Colorado, um, Arizona, New Mexico, Utah. Mm -hmm. so. so somehow you changed the circulation pattern so that there was more precipitation at the four corners area. Yeah. Very yeah. interesting, okay. Yeah. And, and, and because I assume that we're irrigating, that water has to come from somewhere, it's coming from Owens Valley, Northern California, Colorado, those areas are getting less water now so they would have less precipitation around those areas is that possible well, if what you're happened? irrigating less yeah i mean if this is all remember this is all model world so all we we do is say okay these areas require this much water to sustain the agriculture and that transpires and then we see that it definitely does contribute to precip in that area now there's a lot of sources for that water no so um, currently, I don't know if there are restrictions. Are there? In, like, yeah, in or in the California? Yeah, there's, uh, yeah, there's some. They're starting to put in restrictions in California. There's a shortage. Even for the agricultural areas? Uh, I'm not too hip to that right now. I think there is, okay. but I'm not sure. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Then that would. I'm. I'm guessing that would affect. But you know, it's on the order of ten to twenty percent of that precip. So it's not a huge amount in terms, it's not like the totality of that precip. Most of that water is coming from the Pacific Ocean. Right, but irrigation water comes from further inland, right? So it comes from other wilderness yeah. areas. Yeah, and I think part of it also comes from the Colorado River Basin. Uh, they, they do, part of the water does go to California. So do you think it would be an accurate statement to say when we build our dams and our aqueducts, we're moving water from one area to another area, usually the urban centers or agricultural centers. So those areas might have a little bit more rain, but then the wilderness areas where you're taking the water away from would then maybe have less rain. Would you say that might be true statement? No, no, this is, 
I, 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 the, the vast majority, particularly in the West, the vast majority of the precip comes from oceanic moisture. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I can't put a number to it right now, but, but I would say changing that, what, what you're asking is let, if we take water from the Colorado River Basin and, and take it to California, will that affect the climate in the Colorado River Basin? That's your question, right? Yeah, because it will have less water there, right? Shouldn't it? Yeah, but it's just so small. Like this is already a semi-arid region. You know, let's say the Colorado River Basin of the precip that falls in the Colorado Basin, uh, 80 to 90 percent re-evaporates and just goes straight east. Mm -hmm. The basin itself is really only working with, you know, 10 percent of that rain. So, and, and very little of the water in the Colorado River is recycled. Right. I don't know. I don't have a good number for you right now, but it's it's a small amount. I right. don't think so. I don't think it'll be that that big of a deal. Um, there's a, there's a bunch of other problems that it causes, you know, but I don't think precip is one of them. OK, um, but it does seem to me the water equation because irrigation water doesn't come from the ocean, right? Irrigation water comes Correct. from other yeah. places so yeah. somewhere along the way that water disappears maybe it's over a spread out region and it's so it's not really affecting the precipitation but it's just it should end up somewhere but it, but it affects the 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 surface and subsurface water of these other regions and that's that's critical that so that's that's the main problem right taking this water from one basin to the other mm -hmm. where we're all this is all a semi-arid region right. uh, desperately in need of water so so it, when you said in the 2012 drought how or did you say 10 percent was a, its effect from california like 10 percent of the drought in the midwest uh, was due to california not california but areas to the west of the midwest so mm -hmm. you know the the plains all the way to the rockies um it was actually more it was like 60 percent of the deficit was coming from terrestrial regions Oh, wow. A large percent. Yeah. Mm. And, and, but yeah, and, uh, and you, you don't know how much the our land use would affect that number, do you? Or like, I don't. Mm -hmm. I don't. No, no, like changes in land use. How could that change? Have you heard of Milan Milan's research? When no. he's a climatologist from Spain, and Spain was losing its reign. And so the Spanish government asked him to look at it. And he okay. came to the conclusion that because Spain was paving over its nature and changing, you know, how much deforesting stuff that the, there would be less evapotranspiration and that was adding to the incoming water vapor from the ocean to create rain. And so that's why he came to the conclusion that it was, it was that. Up. Yeah. Ah, uh, it could be. I mean, ma massive, massive land use changes. Yeah, they definitely affect climate in some regions, um, like in the Amazon, um, in Cal in the Colorado River Basin, does it change climate? Uh, I'm not sure. I'm nope. not sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you want to actually, yeah, do you want to actually speak maybe a bit about your South American modeling? So like, sure. Yes. Uh, yeah. So um, as I said, so Part of this is uh, work that we've done using a, a climate model at high resolution, uh, and we put uh, tracers. So these are numerical tracers, but you can imagine them as you know putting a dye over a region. So so you select a region and you put this this dye, and then in the model you can actually kind of follow this as that water transpires uh it can be uh it can be uh contribute to clouds or it can be advected downwind um it can then rain and then you know where this water then contributed to rain so in the amazon forest we did this exercise uh using a 20-year run so where 
yeah, we, we put essentially this numerical die over the Amazon forest and then uh, followed that water in time and space for a long time. So it's, it's a really cool experiment that you can do with uh, numerical models. It's these tracers. And I think, yeah, I looked at your, your video on that. So I think what you had was, so there's water vapor yeah. coming from Brazil and the Amazon and it blows eastward and it hits the Andes mountains in Colombia and then it goes south when south. it hits the mountains. Yeah, yeah. And then it's it goes the all Andes the way to the- This barrier that doesn't let a lot of this moisture cross. And so, yeah, it just goes east, hits the mountains and then veers south and contributes to that basin downwind, which is the La Plata River Basin. So that basin is a super important basin in South America uh, in terms of uh, socioeconomic activity. Um, and so as this water from the Amazon is on its way south, um, those e that eastern side of the Amaz of the Andes Mountains that hits the Am that you know the beginning of the Amazon basin, uh, that is actually one of the rainiest places on Earth. And roughly more than half of that water that falls in that area, is from the Amazon basin itself. So it's just an amazing amount of water that's being recycled and then falls on the eastern side of the Andes mountains. And then it goes south to, to which countries uh, in South America? So it'll be, down? you know, um, uh, Peru, uh, then it'll go to Bolivia and um, Argentina. Mm. So are there droughts happening in, in further south that are due to this deforestation of Amazon? Uh, no, I don't think so. Uh -huh. um, yes, so I this question gets asked all the time and I, so, okay, I, I shouldn't say definitively no, but um, I believe that what the Amazon deforestation has really big local impacts but in terms of Argentina, I don't have enough evidence to, to kind of link any type of drought to Amazonian deforestation. And I, I do get asked this question all the time. And I honestly, at the beginning of my research, I thought for sure this is the case. And now I don't, none of, the, none of my studies have have conclusively shown this. <laughs> okay. So what does happen to the water vapor um, as you deforest? So um, it's a relatively small fraction of the total rain that falls in, in, the, in Argentina. Um, so part of it is just, there's a bit less, but the, the, the difference is that you have more water coming in from the ocean. So it kind of uh, equilibrates. You have less local, but more remote. So you don't see a huge change in the precip. Oh, interesting. So why is there more water coming in from the ocean when you defrost? Because of circulation. You see, this is like the crazy thing about, about this problem that you have in in the Amazon, it's actually slightly different from what I was explaining over the California Central Valley. Here, what our, our hypothesis right now, based on what we've seen with the models, is that when you deforest, you're creating a surface that is less rough and you can accelerate the, the wind. So one thing that we clearly see in these simulations is that you have stronger wind speeds right over the deforested regions. So think about it like, like a canal, right? Like if you have a vegetation and you have water going over that vegetation, then you, you put concrete over this canal and then that water will just accelerate because mm. it's not as rough. So we think that's what's happening, that you, you cut down all these tall trees and then you have an acceleration of the wind that then brings in more water from the ocean. This is what we what we see in the model. I think we still need a lot of work, like with different models. Uh, but but for now, this is my best explanation. <laughs> that so, 
Yeah, I'm a little curious. So doesn't water vapor flow in all the way up to like a thousand meters, but the trees are yeah. only, the trees are not very tall, right? 20 meters tall. So how can something 20 meters tall affect a yeah, thousand meters because, away? Because the surface roughness is super important up until, you know, the entire boundary layer, which can be 2000 meters or, or more. So the surface roughness is a super important characteristic of the low level winds including you know going up to a couple of kilometers oh because maybe it creates a turbulence and some of that turbulence yeah, yeah, goes yeah. up it's exactly yeah exactly that uh it's the the surface is a very important source of turbulence uh and once you're removing these trees you're completely changing the mechanical turbulence in the lower atmosphere so i, I guess you could imagine like if you had a pipe uh, and then if the pipe was really smooth but if the pipe was really rough the water would Maybe get really turbulent as it flow and maybe flow exactly. much slower um, as exactly. it flows through its pipe. Yes, exactly. It's exactly that. And then, does the air, as the water vapor then goes to the south part of South America, is it then blow out to the ocean a lot quicker rather than getting trapped because there's less friction too? It's a little bit too too far away. So then it'll be it, it's accelerated. Again, in these in these simulations, we only deforest the Amazonian region. So par part of the Amazonian region. So then the wind gets accelerated. We see a little bit more rainfall downwind. So you have kind of more, uh, a more transport away from the Amazon, higher precip in the La Plata basin, but it's not statistically significant. So I can't really say for sure that there's more rain in the, in the La Plata. What I can say is that we don't see less. We don't see mm. less rain due to deforestation. Okay, well, that's very interesting. Um, it's completely did, counterintuitive. <laughs> has other people, did you guys discover this effect or someone else discovered it also? So, so, okay, a lot of people have investigated this and they use different types of models. Um, I think there is consensus that the deforestation decreases precipitation within the deforested region okay the mechanism i think is up for grabs so if you ask me and i quantified this with tracers within the model there's no change in recycling okay but this is controversial if you ask somebody else they'll tell you for sure there's there's changes in recycling but we use tracers like we we use kind of the state of the art way to looking at this problem and we didn't find we didn't find changes in recycling we we found very significant changes in the circulation and so the circulation decreases rain in the local area exactly and why why does it do that why would uh, the oh, circulation for decrease this, the rate? For the same reason. So then you're accelerating. So you are you have wind, you're accelerating the flow. And so you don't have convergence of that flow. So for rain, you need convergence of this moisture in a certain region. So here, what you're creating is actually divergence. You're, you're taking this moisture away from the region and having it rain downwind. Mm. Yeah. But again, this is controversial. Okay, like... <laughs> can you say a little bit, why, why do different climate models come up with different answers? What, 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 oh, okay. what are you doing differently a... than some other climate models? Then? This is super, this is a super important question. Um, th many of these processes are a function of the scale that you're looking at. So most of the work that has already been done is done with uh, global climate models, which are coarse resolution. And so, those models have, they have to kind of approximate a lot of the stuff that happens within a grid cell. Okay. They're just, it's just too, too big to be able to really get, for example, I don't know, a convective storm or details of the topography or the details of the flow with the topography. So in general, when you go to higher resolutions, you're able to resolve a lot more things to 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 you you're able to get a more realistic picture of what's going on so as time has advanced more and more people are using higher and higher resolution simulations to understand this problem um and we're 
coming up with slightly different results than what was done with GCMs. Uh, sorry, with the global climate models, which are the course resolution models. So things are a little bit different when you when you start resolving things that you couldn't see 20 years ago. Mm. So you have high resolution in your models. We do have higher resolution. So this work that I did was at 20 kilometer resolution. And now we're going to go to four kilometer resolution. And then that you're really going to be able to capture a lot of things that before we just couldn't see. Well, that's interesting because turbulence is a multi-scale behavior where you have things at the small, really like centimeter scale affecting things at the kilometer scale. Or millimeter, scale. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so maybe that's why your models are modeling some of this turbulent behavior that they couldn't get. Yes, yes. And um, another thing that is super critical, like once you go to four kilometers is convection. So actually, try, actually getting at these... Um, these circulations that form clouds and then they organize and form storm systems you really can't do that with coarse models so if you if you are above four kilometers you can't do this you have to be at this scale which is called the convective resolving scale or convection permitting scale oh wow interesting and this is kind of the new frontier like a lot of people are putting energy into this because it's revealing physical mechanisms that really the course models just can't see. Mm. And are you putting in different parameters too, or different variables that are not in those models? In the course models? Mm, no, actually. So, so the, the beautiful thing about going to higher, these higher resolutions is that you actually have to put less parameterization. So less approximations. So once you, you're, you're really resolving convection as opposed to having to approximate it with some statistical way uh so so the higher resolution it, you actually have to put to make less assumptions mm. about about the system which is really nice but it comes at, at enormous computational cost All right. so that's, that's how long do your simulations take <laughs> so um to simulate uh 20 years took us it, for South America, and this is done on the NCAR, the National Center for Atmospheric Research. It's done on their supercomputers by this person who's an expert. It took them a year to do this. Oh wow, it, that's crazy! It's, <laughs> so it's it's a, and it, and this is using thousands of processors, right? Mm. And the output, like right now, we're running into an issue of. Um, like the, the one run for the historical time time period takes almost a petabyte. So like storing this is a problem <laughs> anyway. Wow, so. so you can't do multiple simulation, multiple no, runs. No, no, that's the problem. They're super expensive. Like they're, they're gonna tell us a lot of interesting things, uh, but yeah, but we can't do too many of these. And this is a group of like a hundred scientists trying to do this. Wow. And then for the clouds, does it also matter the resolution there? Is there clouds that form at smaller resolutions that you don't oh, yeah. see? And so that will affect absolutely. the rain and stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. That's the main reason that we're doing this, because the rain is much better resolved at these high resolutions than at the coarse resolutions. So are you seeing more kind of moisture hopping that you might not see at these smaller resolutions, do you think? Or? So uh, we don't know yet, we, mm -hmm. I, because we're just running this. Uh, we're going we're gonna to finish the run pretty soon, so, mm -hmm. but we haven't analyzed moisture hopping at all. Okay. And, and, but uh, I, do you see more clouds when you have more resolution than, than like the larger coarse grain models? More clouds? Uh, not necessarily. I think it's more that we resolve them better the way that they are beginning than uh, organize and move. So, so a big part of precipitation in a lot of regions, including the central US and parts of South America comes from mesoscale convective systems. And, and the course models just have a super hard time getting these guys correct. Uh, but with the high resolution, you can actually get this like the cloud formed oh it developed deep convection oh, okay it organized it's moving and these systems are super important for rainfall 
uh, and you can only get them at the convective resolving scale. You can only get them correctly at the convective resolving scale. Okay. And so, so I mean, in the U.S. too, on the West Coast, right, there's been a lot of deforestation. Like, is that, is that somehow show up in your models as a, some kind of effect? I have not studied deforestation in the U.S. Mm -hmm. The only thing that I've done in terms of land use is the the irrigation work. I, and I did some urbanization, but yeah, just very, I, I don't know. I honestly don't know about, about U.S. deforestation. Okay. So, yeah. So if it was the same effect, then that area where you deforested would have a, li a little bit less rain uh, if, if it was the same effect as in the South America, but it may not be the same effect. It may not be. Yes, mm -hmm. it may not be. Um yeah, I, I don't know. You know, one of the, the dreams that I have is to do um, a, a simulation to understand, you, you know, the central plains of the United States used to be grass, grasslands. And we've basically completely changed the land cover um, to crops, essentially. So I don't know. I like I. I one of my dreams is to understand, you know, how has this change from grasslands to crops affected the water cycle, the atmospheric part and the surface and subsurface, because that was a massive land use change that occurred. But it was 100 years ago. So, yeah. Do you more. have some guesses as to what might happen? Um, I think that, I, I do think it, it must have affected precip, but I'm not a hundred percent sure. Yeah, M more like kind of the longevity of storms because anyway, I this will take two, <laughs> but the the grass transpire kind of more and for longer than crops. Although crops transpire very much when they're mature, but but for grasses, you have kind of this longer period of transpiration and they also have super deep roots. So I, I don't know. It's just seems to me like such a different scale of the, the time scale of how these think to these two land covers behave. Like mm -hmm. one is like a quick, quick response. And the other one is like this long response. I don't know. Okay. But, yeah. Wow, very interesting. So um, I saw Antonio Nobre, you know, his work, right? And he had yeah. some models of the Amazon deforestation, how it affected the precipitation. Do you all work, sure. agree with his or do you find different results than his? So, um, okay, so as as far as I, uh, all, the, the work that I have read from, from Nobre, um, he absolutely uh, believes that deforestation will decrease the precipitation recycling. And again, you know, I would say that most of the community thinks that, including myself up until I, I did this work. So I, like, if you were to show him these results that we got, he would probably disagree with, with what I'm showing. And I do think that we need a lot more studies like repeating what I did with different models um, to see if we get a consistent result. But, and, and actually some very, also very recent studies um, show that a, some, a somewhat similar result using again, a high resolution model. So I don't know, I don't know. I think it's still up for grabs. Um, if you ask me, I. I don't think deforestation uh, causes a decrease in recycling, but it does cause a decrease in precip, which is the worrying part. Like regardless, this this has huge consequences to, to be decreasing precipitation because of our changes in land use. Mm. He, he's saying there's more decrease in precipitation outside the Amazon, whereas you're saying there's a little bit less of a decrease in precipitation, is that right? So as far as I know, he's saying that the decrease in precipitation is because of decrease in recycling, because of deforestation. That's as far as I understand the argument, his argument. Okay. Um, 
And you, and so you, the main differences that you see is that when you deforest, you're having more ocean water blow in, and then you're also having bigger winds because there's more turbulence, uh, less turbulence from the Correct. ground. Yeah. Correct. So it's like compensating the inflow of, of moisture from the ocean is compensating the decrease from the evapotranspiration. Do you think it would lead to more extreme weather behavior if you have bigger winds blowing in from the ocean? Uh, it, it could. Yeah, it could. Changes in wind patterns combined with more moisture coming in from the ocean. Yeah. But yeah, I, I don't know. I haven't looked at the extremes. Cause it seems to me that that might lead to more monsoons or atmospheric rivers blowing in if there's more bigger Correct. wind. Correct. But then might lead to bigger we floods. Do see, yeah, we do see an accelerator. So if you, so if you look at the the low level jet again, um, which the, so so in South America, sometimes they call the low level jet the an atmospheric river. So we do see more. Uh, vapor transport coming in with the with the low level jet. Hmm. And, and oh yeah, in, in regards to these jets and uh, higher higher atmospheric velocity things, like you said, somehow is that right? That some of the weather things that happen in South America affects the U.S. too. Is that right? The the water vapor patterns that you affect in South America somehow so have a ripple effect to America. USA. So there's some work, uh, not it's not my work, but showing how the South American monsoon and the North American monsoon are linked dynamically. Um, that would be kind of the the only mechanism through very large scale circulation. Um, oof, but I don't. Like I have not worked on this. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um. And okay. Uh, and then you've also done work on uh, groundwater and climate uh, correlations. You want to say a little bit about that work? Yeah. So, um, when you are doing climate modeling, you are really interested in what we call sources of memory. So essentially parts of the system that vary at long time scales. So the ocean is currently the most important source of memory for the climate system. So that's why we really need to get the ocean right to get climate right. And one of the things that my group is working on is the role of groundwater in climate modeling. And that's an, a similar problem in the sense that groundwater varies really slowly. And if you have vegetation that taps into that groundwater, they'll have kind of this more continuous source of moisture than if, if they're just reliant on precip from the surface. So the precip that percolates from the surface. So what we have shown for South America again, is that when you include groundwater, um, there's this really large region of the La Plata Basin where you're able to better represent the, the precipitation and temperature patterns in that region because you're representing the groundwater better. Um, and now what I'm doing right now is, okay, like we, we think we have a good handle that we, we really need to represent groundwater better. But if you don't have the plants that can tap into this groundwater, um, then you're not getting like that biophysical mechanism that links the below ground to the atmosphere. So what we're trying to do is say, okay, you know, most models, they have a maximum rooting depth of about two meters, but in reality, you can have 18, 20 meter roots, especially in the Amazon, you have really deep root systems. So what happens when you when you include the groundwater and the roots into this system? Are we able to kind of better capture these these kind of longer scale oscillations and can we better represent precipitation patterns and all these other um, aspects of the climate system? Right. So yeah, so sometimes we have this wet season and a dry season and the dry season will have less evapotranspiration if you don't take into account the groundwater, but 
because the tree roots can bring up that groundwater through a process called hydro redistribution Correct. and pass it around to the soil, then that water can then evapotranspire and create rain, um, exactly. I guess, in the dry season. So then exactly. there'd probably be less extreme uh, extremes of rain in the rain. Yeah. So, exactly. so, so as we deplete, because all around the world, we're really depleting groundwater really badly. And so sometimes it gets beneath the tree roots. And so we're making, so would you say that then we're now oscillating wet season, dry season, the rain oscillates a lot more than it used to because the groundwater isn't able to buffer that? I, maybe, I think so. Um, okay, this is a little bit complicated because, I, so at least in South America, the opposite is happening in the La Plata Basin. That water table is actually rising because um, of the changes in land use. So it's kind of, it's really weird. It behaves a little bit different than in other parts of the world where really you do see this like rapid decline in the water table. In South America, in the La Plata Basin, changing from grasses to croplands, which is what's happened in southern, in southeastern South America, is actually making the water table shallower. So anyway, that's just kind of what what's happening in South America. But you do have a great point, which is once you deplete the water table where it's no longer accessible for vegetation, then that vegetation is solely reliant on precip. So, mm. so that's a, yeah, that's a much more vulnerable plant, but I don't know how extensive this is around the world where, you know, how, how large an area is vulnerable in this sense, in terms of the vegetation. Mm. I mean, it'd be interesting, I guess, if groundwater is the cause of the extreme weather we're seeing like if ground i mean if there's a Ooh, if you could say groundwater is groundwater depletion is leading to more extreme weather i don't know if you can i mean say the that thing simply is that climate change is just such a it, it's like this huge hammer that's changing everything right and so i think changes in land use will compound this but climate change is just wreaking havoc on extremes and yeah, and it's happening all over the world. And we can now really attribute this to, to climate change. Right. But, but I, I was just trying to draw the causality arrow that there might be things causing the climate change too, right? So. No, I mean, I, I guess, I guess, sorry, I, I should have clarified just greenhouse gas, the, the, the forcing caused by increased greenhouse gases is just overwhelming. Mm -hmm. And in that, yeah, we, we just see that so clearly in, yeah, in observations and in the models. Right. Okay. Yeah. And how do you, how does the water vapor play into this whole, when, when the water vapor brings heat up to the, is the, is the, is the surface of the earth kind of cooling because the water vapor is bringing the heat further up into the atmosphere. And so there's more heat further higher up, but less heat lower down is that's what's happening with the water vapor do you know well that's not something you study as much sorry when you're saying uh like because there's more water vapor in the atmosphere in a warmer atmosphere is that what well you're i was saying? saying you could have more evapotranspiration or less evapotranspiration right say in your models so if you have more evapotranspiration from the land then more heat okay. should be bring, being brought from the surface of the earth up into the atmosphere uh, you're saying um vapor but then okay like so instead of the sensible heat it the sensible is latent, latent heat that's okay. transferring to higher up in the atmosphere so you you do have moistening of the upper at you're having moistening at higher levels for sure because of i, I guess now we're getting into greenhouse gas emissions like in terms of the warming of the atmosphere oh no no i was, I was saying let's let's leave out greenhouse or well, let's leave out carbon I mean, if okay. we're talking about greenhouse, it would only be water vapor. And um, so I was just wondering, because if you have bare land or you have forested land, right? Bare ah, land okay. is a lot hotter than the forested land. So that okay. heat is probably transferred to higher in the atmosphere. Is that correct? So in terms, yes. So what, what can happen when you have a, a warmer land surface is that you're creating instabilities in the atmosphere. So 
you convection essentially so you're you're having a higher probability of convection and mixing of the boundary layer so a, a warmer surface leads to a deeper boundary layer so in essence it's what you're saying you're like putting heat higher and higher up into the atmosphere because because you're able to turbulently mix this through convection and then with the forest they're transferring that water vapor in the form of latent heat and that, and then when they turns back into clouds, it releases that heat, right? It releases uh, that heat, yes. So it's it should be hotter, maybe with the forested area higher up than the, with the bare land. Ah, uh, but then, I mean, you do have to take into account that a lot of this just moves all around. Um, does the forest? Yeah, I mean, if you have a forested area with more precip that area is a source of heat when when you have um condensation i mean that is that is what drives the energetics in the upper atmosphere mm. yeah so so yeah so it's interesting yeah talking to you so it, like i'm realizing the importance of this circulation the effect of circulation has on deforestation and so somehow it it's a becoming more turbulent or less turbulent as you deforest the atmosphere or that's not really the right way to look at it so okay i guess i i, I always kind of separate it between so there there's this thermal effect which is um if you let, let's say if you deforest the amazon uh then it will be warmer at the surface um, and you will have more convection. But on the other hand, you also have, um, you also have less roughness at the surface. So it's really complicated. Like mm. it's on the one hand you have, so you have the two types of turbulence. You have turbulence because of buoyancy and you have mechanical turbulence. Right. So, so it's kind of, you know, on the one hand, you heat and you have more buoyancy, and the the other, and the other hand, you you remove the roughness, and so you have a smoother surface, less turbulence. Mm. And what we found was that in the Amazon, this uh, the 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 roughness is the is the winning is winning here. Right. So maybe you but, could say with bare land, you have higher lateral velocity or horizontal velocity. Yes. Of the wind. Yeah, that I think that's that's a good way to put it. Yeah. And uh, and and we usually correlate bigger winds with more extreme weather. But I mean, it doesn't have to be. But yeah, I don't know. I haven't looked at that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. If you have a lot of shear, then you'll have extreme weather. Uh -huh. and, and And at least with wildfires that I know, you know, bigger winds lead to bigger fires so yeah 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 okay cool well that's uh <laughs> that was a very interesting discussion i uh, think we went on all tangents here <laughs> <laughs> um well thank you for uh covering a lot of your research. where where do, where do if people want to look at your research where's the good place for them to um, um take just a look my at your website research? uh at the university of illinois so that's I think that's the best. So they should look up Francina Dominguez and Francina Dominguez, University, of Illinois. University of Illinois. Cool. Yeah. And you have some YouTube videos too, right? So they can look at I have the the one about the um, the Amazon. Yeah, definitely uh, check that one out. Because okay, beautiful. so just type Amazon in your name, and maybe it'll come up. I think so. Yeah, I think so. Okay. Cool. It should it should pop up. All right. Cool. Thank you. Thank you so much. So.